Hello, and welcome to Hyde Park Art Center's Virtual Center Sunday program. Today, I'm joined by artist Chris Papan for a residency dialogue at the culmination of Chris's year-long residency with us at the Art Center. My name is Mega Ralapati. I oversee the Jackman Goldwasser residency, and I've had the great privilege of working with Chris over the course of this year. The residency at the Art Center aims to connect artists deeply with their own practice in the context of our community. Each year we invite international, national, and Chicago-based artists and curators to take part in a uniquely immersive residency experience and complement their mode of production with increased attention toward reflection, reconnection, and research to spark new ideas and considerations in their practice. I'm very happy to introduce Chris Papan, an artist of Kanza, Osage, and Lakota descent. Chris's varied, multifaceted, and detailed work spans drawing, painting, video, installation, and more, and really spans scale. The work is rooted in the Plains native art tradition of ledger art. It's a practice which originated in the mid 19th century through the introduction of ledger books and paper, which the indigenous people of the American Plains used to visually record daily life and lived culture. This of course would be transformed beyond comprehension. And over time, these visual records became known as the practice of ledger art. So Chris's practice itself reflects and reinterprets the ledger art tradition, but has a dash of US 1970s underground cultural practice thrown in. So we're talking heavy metal, music, punk music and culture, hot rod culture, underground comics, among many others, which hopefully we'll talk about a little bit. And as a note, um, earlier in Chris's residency, he gave a fantastic talk on his practice and really focused on the history of ledger art and the tradition of that. So I highly recommend everyone check it out. It's located on the Art Center's YouTube channel um, from earlier this year. Chris Papan is a graduate of the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, and his work has been collected by the National Museum of the American Indian, the Field Museum here in Chicago, the Missoula Art Museum, and the Spencer Museum of Art, among others. So with that, I'm very happy to welcome you, Chris, to this conversation. We, I wish it could be actually inside your studio, where we did manage to spend a good amount of time over this year, but we will have to <laughs> allow the virtual realm to be our studio, your studio for the for the day. Yeah, that's okay. It's you know it's great to be here with you virtually. Um, but hopefully you guys kind of get a little idea of the space that I'm in here. So um, yeah, yeah, thanks for doing this. It's great to be for you to be in your studio. And despite a lot of work moving in and out of your space over these last weeks and months, we still can catch a glimpse of what you've been working on and kind of what's going on in this space. Um, so Chris, as we kind of come to the end and culmination of your residency, I just wanted to ask, this was a kind of a, um, this was a shift for you to have a space like this at this moment in time. I just wanna ask what has having a dedicated studio space and at the Art Center specifically, what's that, what's that meant for your practice? And what have you been able to develop over this time at the Art Center? Um, I mean, this, this was pivotal for me. You know, I have been a full-time artist for, I guess this will be going on three years now. So, so like my third year of being a full-time artist will have an entirely dedicated space to my work. So, um, it's, it's been greater than I imagined. Um, now, and the fact, you know, being here at the Hyde Park Art Center, it really allowed for a lot of dialogue and critical feedback, which was extremely helpful. Um, although, you know, I, I do get some great critical feedback from my wife, Deborah, because she's an artist also. So it's you no, know, that's not that I was lacking in that area really, but um, you know, not having her here with me full time. You know, I don't get her feedback, but so I, I get other feedback, you know, and it, which is which is great. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, you know, it's just and you know, beforehand I was working out of a home studio and you know the space was very limited. I was trying to be careful on, you know, like 
getting too messy and that sort of thing. So here I was able to, you know, throw paint and throw graphite around and, you know, just really help. And that really helped me loosen up really with, with my work. And that was one thing I was, I was really looking forward to is because, you know, working in a small space, you kind of get, you know, kind of closed in and cramped and working real tight and not able to, to really get freer in my, my work. So I, I think that was really helpful for that as well. Um, and it's also made me realize that I, I can't keep working in, in a home studio if, if, I, if I can help it, you know. Um, but we'll talk more about that later. So. Yeah, no, that's such a huge thing, like the, the sort of um, the physical space and the, um, you know, the changing parameters of that. And also like your home being inherently, it's a multi-use space. It's required to do many different things and like the psychological shift that can happen when it's your dedicated space you can um you know it really allows for that your i think an artist's vision to kind of push out of the the boundaries too just the physical space has such a connection to like your psychological ability to think big or think you know think a bit more even risk you know in a more risky way maybe um so yeah definitely definitely risky risky so <laughs> and, and Go ahead, please. And I was gonna say, um, and the uh, the lack of uh, inhibitions to take those risks as well. You know, um, you know, a lot of times I beforehand in my home studio, you know, I would think of something to try, but then I would push it aside or say, no, I can't do that because it's, you know, it's too this or that, or you know, I need to get this done first in order to, you know, try this other thing, but with this space, you know, I can think of something, be like, I'm gonna go try that. And then I can come back to this right afterwards. You know, I don't have to move stuff away to, in order to try something else. And then, you know, there's a lot of shifting of space to, you know, for, you know, to make the work. And it was just, yeah, it was rough. <laughs> <laughs> I know we've spoiled you now. Um, so did you, like, can you give us an idea of what coming into the residency, you know, you knew this, you had this, both the space, but the duration too. What, did, what kind of ideas did you have of what you thought you'd be working on? And I'm curious about, you know, what kind of transpired and what did you end up working on and what did you end up making? And if there's any, you know, anything in the space you want to point to or any particular works, feel free to do that. Uh, actually, what I'll, I'll do at this point is share my screen because I have a created like a gallery of sorts of work that I did create throughout the residency. So, share. There we go. Um, so, coming into the residency, I actually had just started uh, a series of works that were smaller scale. Uh, that I, you know, maybe envision going bigger scale with them. Um, so, you know, so I kind of had an idea of what I wanted to do with a particular series. Um, there we go. Uh, and that was the uh, White Bread and Miracles series. Um, the first couple of pieces I did were like studies, and they were smaller scale. And so then when I came in, you know, this was like one of the first things I did was really worked on this idea. And I, I think I, I, I fleshed it out really well. Um, and so this series of work started from a Boy Scout manual that was supposed to teach children about Native American dance as a hobby. And there are these, um, two teenage uh, dancers um, in different poses of these different dance moves, uh, you know, these static black and white photographs that were just extremely awkward and strange. Um, these and were so this kind of inside the manual. These were in the manual itself. The the figures, yeah. So like this this person was supposed to be demonstrating a what's known as a shield dance. 
Um, and, you know, so this, so the series also became a way for me to kind of reconcile my, my anger and disgust at the idea of taking something that's very spiritual and powerful and reducing it down to, you know, to somebody's hobby. <laughs> uh, you know, our, our culture is not your hobby, is basically what this is. So, so what I wanted to do is kind of imbue that idea of spiritual strength and of you know power into it and also bring back the idea of, of movement and color uh, and into what I know to be Native American dance, whether it's through um, Native American powwows, which is sort of more of a like a pan native idea, but um, the fact that our daughter um, participates in traditional Native American dance in Jemez Pueblo, that's, I think that's what really kind of got to me about this whole idea of, you know, dancing as a hobby, that it's not a hobby, it's, it's a prayer, it's, it's a sacrifice that dancers make for, on behalf of everyone on planet Earth. Um, so, yeah, so this, this is kind of what, what came out of that uh, that beginning of, of the residency here. And then like I, I mentioned about that, you know, critical feedback as I was working on these, um, you know, there were some curators and other uh, professionals coming in and looking at the work and kind of helping me develop the idea more as well. That's great. That's, that's really great. This, so this series, is this ongoing? Is this something you think you'll keep continue kind of contributing to? Yeah, so um, I don't know if you can see in the background there, but I'm, I'm working on developing uh, these ideas to be more of a, like full-blown paintings. Um, and that's another thing that I wanted to do during this residency is to work on drawings and paintings simultaneously. Um, but I've actually been focused on drawing on these uh, mixed media uh, drawings for so long that I, I kind of was rusty in my painting. So it was kind of taking me a while to get back into it. So um, this, <laughs> and you've probably seen this painting go through uh, a, a few uh, different uh, stages during my residency here. So this is that, that same painting that I had with a map across the middle of it and now it's felt totally completely painted over and done in something else but yeah so my idea now is to continue on this this series as as uh, as paintings which will then be able to allow me to explore um rendering these figures in different ways and um and and new challenges too with them right. um, I, that's it's such a um, it's a great view into an artist's kind of process and approach to think about these the images that you're showing us in the um, PowerPoint are like a you call them a study for me they're so full and resolved in themselves but they're operating for you as a kind of study or a sketch to be then kind of um, pushed it looks like pushed into something else a larger painting. Um, I can see these also going in so many different directions, especially when you talk about like the content and the richness of what's happening inside. You're you're you know alluding to movement, um, and and really talking about like the function of dance as having this high. You know, it's not not only is it not a hobby, it's almost greater than an art form per se. It's about a broader spiritual connection to something greater. There's it's sacred which I don't know that everyone would say about all art necessarily, but you're trying to capture that, you know, quite profound collective experience of experiencing the dance and participating in it. So even though this work for me is, is so fantastic and resolved in itself, I can just see this becoming more and more three-dimensional, if not literally three-dimensional, just like filling out the, you know, a canvas or, you know, I don't know. Do you ever think about, I mean, another question I had was 
Um, you know, how exactly did you, can you talk about how you experimented with technique or what did experimentation look like for you? And do you think, for example, like, do you ever um, think about actually making these figures move? What is, you know, what does that look like or what, what would it look like? So that's, that's a lot there. But I guess the question is like, how did you kind of think about experimentation with, within a body of work like this one, A White Bread and Miracles? Um, well, I mean, I, first of all, you know, just the figures and, um, you know, blending them with the animal heads, which then represents transformational figures, which come from, uh, you know, creation stories and that sort of thing. Um, kind of expanding the scale on those was, was a bit of, of an experiment. Um, and also, you know, these, you know, trying to uh, portray them in these awkward static poses kind of, you know, there was a challenge in that in, in order to get them to feel like they were moving sort of. <laughs> I, I think, you know, I think with, um, altering them to become the, these, uh, you know, these hybrid figures. I think that really helped in, in that. Um, also, this um, with with this piece in particular, you can kind of see how uh, there is experimentation in the uh, the the, uh, the application of of the map collage above there. Um, that was sort of an experiment that's kind of leading me to some other, uh, some other pieces that I'll show you in a minute uh, later on. So this was kind of like almost the emptiness of, of that, uh, the quantum drawing. So, um, so just so we are, we're, you know, to, there's so many layers going on here. So if we talk about what we're looking at. When we talk about ledger art, that led the tradition of the ledger paper, that's the the medium. That is the kind of first layer. And then, actually, if you could go back to the image with the map on it, um, because the way you've layered it on, it's not you know many things are obscured. You don't you don't really necessarily notice that map element being separate from the paper. Can you talk about what is the you know what did you start with starting with the paper? How you built the surface up. Um, because you've done it, but so fluidly, it almost looks like it was always like this in a way, but there's lots of layers going on here. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so I, they, actually all of them, they do have map elements in them. Um, so like in, in this one, in the, in the lower section by her knees, there's, um, there's map going across there. And I, I chose the, that particular map to kind of match the color of the background going through there. And same with this one in the lower, section there's you, know, you can see the orange map that kind of match that orange behind him um so i i always started out with the figure um and then i developed the figure first and then i i kind of like figure out what's going to happen behind them after the figure is on there so you know that's why these um map sections and the um geometric patterns are in different places just because the figures have you know different um, different poses and um, different different space about them so I needed to fill in the space differently um, and so that you know that was that was pretty experimental in that way too and that how you know they're all a certain all the works work together as a series but each one is um, individual in its own right um so i started with the figure and then kind of fill in the space and then i i wanted to also uh portray dance through the idea of uh the native american powwows through uh bold color choices that i that i made because if you go to a powwow you see a lot of you know bright flashy colors and stuff so that was that was another way to imbue the idea of dance into these works. Um, yeah, so then I would I would do uh, like the block of color, and then um, and then kind of finish it off with the 
ornamental uh, geometric patterns that you'll see. And then with this one, like the, the dots kind of going all over the top, that would have been, you know, the final, the final thing. So it, yeah, it's interesting how you say, you know, these are, they're definitely all finished works, but yeah, I, I do think of them as studies because whenever I'm working on something, I always think of, you know, what's coming next, you know, what, how can I push this idea further and you know, the, you know, things, you know, for a lot of artists aren't always finished, you know, it's, things are always still a work in progress. These ideas are still works in progress, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, so this is kind of um, the, a, a sort of study for the painting that's behind you, which, yes, I almost don't recognize it because you say you're rusty <laughs> at, in your painting practice, but you've like transformed <laughs> both your studio, but even that work so much that it's a totally new work to me, to my eyes. Um, how, oh, yeah. Yeah. how are you, so how are you, are you thinking about that translation of this to this, you know, larger scale, it's also a broader palette. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, you know, going from black and white to color, which is um, always a challenge, um, you know, when you're working with, Graphite and pencil, you know, it's it's working uh, light to dark, I guess, and then painting is the opposite, dark to light, usually, in most most cases. So it's kind of having to think in a, in an opposite direction. Um, but you know, I'm I'm still trying to bring those elements that I had in the drawings into the painting, like you know, with the bold use of color. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's still a work in progress. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear that. I hear that. And I really, I just feel like there's so much um, of this, like this material to, to be expanded out. And I think, I, I imagine this body will keep reverberating for you. We'll see, we'll have to see how it does. But on the, um, on the kind of subject of the ledger art tradition and it being such an important foundation for your work, um, I was thinking about, about, you know, historically uh, ledger art was a way, you know, was a, a, it kind of was a tool and a document for telling the stories of how people lived in real ways and their cultural practices, traditions, and a visual, you describe it as a visual record of that. So it's a form of storytelling in a way. So I was thinking about how you think of narration or storytelling in your work. You know, obviously with this um, of White Bread and Miracles, there's this um, kind of like the, the thing that initiated it was the discovery of the manual, the Boy Scout manual, and this tradition in the U.S., a very particular tradition of how, you know, young boys are raised and, and introduced to many ideas about, I, I don't know, <laughs> manhood. Um, so that was, it, it's, it, I understand that's the sort of founding piece for that body of work, but can you talk more broadly? How do you, how do you think about storytelling or do you, in your work or a disrupt disrupting a certain story that we know uh, yeah i mean there's i i feel that there's different ways to tell stories um you know there's a very uh you know linear way to tell the story and then there's um ambiguous ways to tell a story and to let people kind of make a judgment about what's being told, I think. Um, so I, I wanted to include a, a few examples of some other works that kind of tell a specific story. Um, and again, these are all works that were created during my time here. So um, these are two pieces that I did that feature my interpretation of the Buffalo woman who was like, a, a creator or the embodiment of the creator in Lakota stories. Um, 
And so basically the stories that I try to tell reflect the idea of what traditional ledger art did and that it was telling the story of that artist, um, of experiences of that artist. So, you know, so back then, mid 1800s, men were, you know, having battles against other nations or against the you know, US cavalry, or, you know, they were illustrating their experience of being forcefully removed from their homeland into a prison camp. Um, but that's not my experience as a native person. My experience is something completely different. Um, you know, again, you, you would, you'd mentioned that, you know, my influences being, uh, you know, underground comics and sci-fi movies and, you know, the same sort of experiences that we've all had, that we all grew up with. Um, so I try to blend those influences into a visual telling of my experiences as Native people. So with, with this piece in particular, it's the creator, Buffalo woman who's resisting uh, colonial forces of invasion, that being the, represented by the UFOs. And she wants to sit, she wants you, the viewer, to come sit down and she wants to tell you the truth about things that, you know, that we don't have to accept um, lower standards for ourselves, that we can get rid of these. Um, you know, these things that are given to us because, you know, we're pitied as, oh, you know, poor Native people, they need this and that. And, you know, we, we can make our own, uh, our own life for ourselves. Um, we're sovereign nations, you know, we, we have that agency to do that. And so basically that's the story that I'm telling with this piece is that, that, you know, we're stronger than what is, imposed upon us. Now with this piece, this is kind of more of a uh, uh, commentary on uh, Native interpersonal relationships, I guess. Um, the title is uh, Coyote O is Indianer at You. So in my experience, as a native person, I've come across people who uh, try to be more more native than native. I guess it would be a, a diplomatic way to say that. Um, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't want to, you know, put that in a negative light either. It's just that, you know, this is sort of a unique phenomenon. I think that we as Native people experience with each other. Um, and, you know, I've, I've witnessed this with, with some of my friends too, that, you know, I, I thought at one point they would be comfortable with who they are uh, in terms of, you know, knowing their Native heritage and, you know, where they've grown up and, you know, that sort of thing. And then all of a sudden, you know, things happen in their life and all of a sudden they're, you know, these wise native sages that are going around, you know, um, you know, maybe doing, you know, ceremonies for people or something. And, you know, this is totally not the person I knew before. And it's just kind of like, wow, what happened to them, you know? And so th this is kind of a, a comment on that. Um, and again, I, I think it's uniquely Native American, <laughs> unfortunately, but um, you know it's it's just things that that we deal with in, in this contemporary society, and it's, and it's kind of strange. And you know, I, I think about why why would somebody just kind of all of a sudden you know be more native than they were? Um, you know, maybe they're getting paid, or I don't know. <laughs> you know. It's just it's it's just it's interesting. It's an interesting observation, and I think 
I think this is kind of like a, a maybe a diplomatic way to, to, bring, to bring that to light through this work, but also in a humorous way as well. So yeah, uh, so yeah, so uh, just a little bit about the piece. So uh, the actual Buffalo woman, the creator, you know, in, in you know, being uh, confident in who she is, you know, she has this extreme power, you know, there's like a, there's a mushroom cloud going off in her hand, but, you know, she's in control of it. And, you know, kind of hearkening back to traditional native stories of how Coyote's the trickster, you know, he's, he's wearing this hat being more native than, than he really is. And, you know, he's holding this matchstick saying, look, I, I have this power too, you know, I can, you know, I, I can set fire to, to the, the trailer just as easily as he can. But you know he's never gonna have that that power that that is truly there. Does that make sense? Yeah, it definitely does. And I really hear what you're saying. I you know I think that that you know the experience you're describing is probably very unique to the community that you know, but the phenomenon is not. I think that's something that a lot of cultural communities feel in their own really unique specific way. Um, you know, like, I mean, it's complex. It's definitely complex. It's about a certain type of presentation to the, you know, to the outside world. It might be about an idea of resistance or participation maybe, but I mean, I really hear that. Um, what I was thinking about too with, you know, this work and the previous work too is you mentioned that historically, the practice of ledger art making work on this, you know, this particular type of paper, the substrate, while it kind of in a whole and in totality, it, it sort of ended up providing a window into life, culture, cultural tradition of a group of people. You're so, it's such a great point that you make that it's actually the perspective of an individual artist. It's that person's view and their, their, um, it's their eyes and their hand, it's what their hand did. Um, and that you know, really ties to the, this, this idea that your work is so uniquely yours. You have such a visual vocabulary and language that's so specific to you. I don't think anyone could ever see, you know, could see this work and mistake it for another artist. Um, and there's something really great about that. The idea that, um, it's ultimately your pers you know, particular perspective on your life with the hybrid influences that you have that this work ends up being. And it's not, it's, it's a really great kind of um, building upon the tradition, the ledger art tradition, because it's also so specific to you as the artist and it's not universalizing in any way. And it's not like offering, you know, when we think about the stories that are told to us about what it means to be an American, what it means to be in the US, from the US, for example. You know, that we're often, when we're told, taught history, it's often in a very totalizing, universalizing way. You know, this is what happened. This is what facts are. This is how history is taught. This is what happened. And, you know, at least for me personally, growing going through school, it was a very late stage where I was like, oh, wait, <laughs> this history that I'm being taught is a certain story that's being told to me, one of, an endless number of stories that could be told. I, it's my work then to go back and undo and unlearn and rebuild that story for myself. And sometimes you're so right, it's not linear. Sometimes it's cyclical. Sometimes it's, it's so many other things. Um, but there's something great about even in kind of uh, review, you know, thinking about his, uh, history or, or creating new stories, responding to older stories that your work doesn't try to um, offer an alternative universal, you know, this is the story that should replace those. That it, your your work is, this is my perspective on this. Um, it's There's something so personal and so specific to you. And I feel like there's, um, there's something really powerful in that. And it kind of speaks to this idea too of this work of, you know, this journey is unique to each of us. And even when you are part of the same cultural community, your truth and your, your journey is gonna be different than someone else's, even if you share, you know, share, share many things. So that's all just a way to say, I think there's, um, 
you know, providing a really unabashedly specific new, you know, nuanced view of one's perspective is, is it's um, definitely uh, something that comes through really strongly in your work. I, I thank you for that. And it's, you know, it's really interesting too, when you say that, because, you know, there are those that have said that my work doesn't really fit into ledger art. Um, you know, and these are people that are not native and, you know, are considered uh, experts. And, you know, and it's, you know, at, you know, at first you're like, you know, it's, it's kind of disheartening. You're just like, oh, but then, you know, you have to think and you have to realize that, you know, no, this is, this art form belongs to us and we get to decide what it is and what it isn't. And, you know, and yes, it's, it's on ledger paper, but, you know, there's, there's other stories being told. And what's interesting is that, you know, I was once told that it's, it's not, my work isn't ledger art because it's not a warrior on a horse, but yet there are other, other examples of historical ledger art that aren't warriors on a horse, but are still considered that, you know, there, there are drawings at, at the field museum by a very prolific Kiowa artist who has drawings of him having these visions during peyote ceremonies. You know, there are drawings of, you know, ceremonial groups doing these ceremonies that are, you know, um, maybe some of them are lost now. Um, you know, and so, you know, that, that was really influential to me and, in, you know, seeing this artist from, you know, over a hundred years ago, you know, kind of doing the same thing that, that I try to do in my work as well. So, so don't try to tell me that it's not ledger art. <laughs> That's so interesting to think about, you know, to think about, um, like the the stakes that some people might have in making sure that ledger art continues to look and act and behave in a certain way and and behave in a way that it has historically like there's something about you know maybe like a need i i don't know what exactly mo motivate that but a need for it to stay in the past whereas what you're doing is you know it's um i, I think you've talked about like uh, the, or, or maybe people, so, so your work has been described as sort of updating ledger art in a way, but I think about it more as this is a certain approach to creating visually. It's a tool in a way, and the tool is going to play out and look differently in the year 2020 than it did in, you know, 1850. And to really, um, you know, have facility with the tool and to make it one's own and to be able to, you know, um, incorporate other elements, visual elements, um, allows it to live on. I feel in a, in a longer term way than feeling that it well one needs to sort of aesthetically um, maintain certain parameters, but also not live. I think there's something about that. Your approach to it to me is like an infusion of oxygen and energy, and allow. I, I also imagine it would really grab some people, artists, non-artists, young people, you know, others who may or may not relate to a traditional form of ledger, but feel like, hey, this could be for me. So there's something about that living, breathing um, nature of it that I think you're really able to, to make happen. Yeah, and that's, that's definitely something I strive for is that, that continuity of culture, you know, to yeah, to, to just update it and make it relevant for today. I think it's, it's extremely important. And it's just kind of, it's, it's disappointing and frustrating at times that there are those people that try to keep our work and who we are as people in the past. And, you know, it's just that, that constant wall that we keep having to, you know, climb over. <laughs> I'm not gonna say let the wall stop us. I say, no, we just have to keep climbing over it. You know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, you, you mentioned sci-fi. 
books and films as an influence of yours too. And science fiction is such an important genre and sort of approach to fiction and creating for, for so many artists. Um, we've talked about, you know, um, the past it, in a way and sort of the way ledger art has historically been um, presented and, and used and how it's functioned. And then you were kind of talking about your work as bringing it into a very current present moment. Um, that's how I think about it. But I, I'm curious about the future too, or your idea of your idea of the future. Um, science fiction has been often used by artists as a way to imagine realities that aren't present at the moment, um, to, to imagine possible, you know, not just the future per se, like the year 3000 or something, but to imagine just possibility, possible paths that um, we can't envision at the moment. Um, so there's, there's such a, there's, you know, world making inside that visioning, um, definitely fiction and creation. But can you talk a little bit about that? Like, how do you, um, how do you think about maybe the future, the idea of the future? Um, if you're, if you're kind of updating ledger art in a way, what do you imagine a possible future looks like for, you know, both your work, but collectively inside, you know, inside your community? I, I think futurism kind of people have like a, a, spe a specific idea, but like a certain idea of what that is. Um, and and I did too. Um, I'm kind of glad to say that that my wife was uh, uh, like right there at the beginning of, of the futurist movement uh, for for native art. Um, and you know, some of my friends are are really in that vanguard with it as well. Um, I, you know, for me, the future, and, and like what the definition of futurism, as I understand it, is that it embodies both the past and the present as well. You know, it's not always constantly looking ahead. It's like, whoa, wait, no, this can be this. And that, you know, what can we imagine the future to be? But it's also, you know, thinking about what happened in the past so that we can change past wrongs in order to create a more idyllic future or to create a more positive future. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not thinking of, again, thinking of that time in a linear way. It's, it's thinking about it more holistically and, you know, thinking about literally our future generations, you know, our children and our children's children. And you know what are we going to leave for them? And you know what actions can we take? What will our actions do to affect our children? So when you think back to the past, you know those relatives, our uh, ancestors were were thinking about you know the actions that they made in their present. How it would affect us today so you know so it both it behooves us to honor them to think in that same way for our for our children so that's that's kind of where i, I i'm at in that um but in terms of of artwork and how to uh how to visualize that you know there's i i guess for me, it's it's more in the use of tools, um, you know, using uh, digital formats to kind of map things out and to, um, you know, to distort and create uh, different perceptions of us uh, visually. So I, I think this is a, a good example of that. Um, I, I will say that I'm, I'm kind of biting off of uh, a good friend's uh, style <laughs> with, with these works. And, and I hope she's okay with that. Um, but- uh, 
this work that we're looking at right now? Yeah, so this, this piece is titled Quantum. And it, it kind of came out of, uh, you know, the whole COVID situation, sort of. I, just thinking about how everyone kind of became fragmented and pushed apart and how we can't be together, um, you know, separation, quarantine. Um, but then also thinking about how, you know, this very small thing is affecting the planet. Um, uh, you know, the quantum idea of how, you know, these very small things have these vibrations that, um, you know, that affect the world that we live in. Um, so kind of taking a microcosm and expanding it to a macrocosm idea. Um, so that's that's kind of where, where this idea is starting with, with this work. And so this is kind of like a new idea that I want to work with and develop, develop further and kind of see where that goes. And do you envision this also looking at the scale and format? Is this also a sort of study for something that could be larger scale or or um, expanded somehow? Most definitely, yeah. This is um, you know again just just trying to trying to visualize that idea and seeing where you know where where it can go. You know how how these things work and how it's received by people. And, you know, just that's you know that's that's one thing that I've uh, learned during this residency too is to kind of not just develop these ideas visually, but also um, you know writing down these ideas and to develop them through through words as well. Uh, How, how does that work for so you? So one of the curators questions was to do a word list. With, you know, with the, so that, you know, that was extremely helpful and something, a, a new thing that I've introduced into my practice, so. Making a word list. How does that work exactly? Yeah. So just uh, like words that come to me as I'm working on things. Um, So like, so you know they they end up being you know really like filling up a, a notebook. So I had one for this one. It's here somewhere. But um, you know, just thinking about again, you know, being in quarantine and um, fragmentation, yet still trying to to remain whole. Um, You know, and certain ideas that I want to convey as well. Um, you know, thinking about colors or yeah, just kind of whatever pops into my head that I think relates to, to the work visually. I, I just I try to write down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a work like this to me, um, like I almost feel like the the inspiration, whether it's words or you know other other ideas feel very multi-sensory it's not just visual to me i can almost um i don't know i can almost feel the image in a way with the way the image in the figure is rendered you know it's it, it's interesting to think about uh, okay so this yep yeah, can you tell us about this this work this other new work of yours yeah sorry about that maybe you were breaking up a little bit there so um yeah so this uh, could be considered an extension of the uh of the white red and miracles pieces um again dealing with boy scouts and the boy scout culture um you know it's that whole thing is it's you know, it's not just cut and dry, it's, it's pretty complicated. Um, I think part of the reason why Boy Scouts like to uh, appropriate Native American culture so much is because there's an actual uh, Dakota man who helped 
during the beginning of the Boy Scouts. And he wanted to teach these kids, you know, the, you know, real native teachings and how, you know, how to live with nature and, you know, how to commune with nature and, you know, to be one with the earth and, you know, all that stuff. So, but, you know, I, I don't know what happened or, you know, why, but he didn't, he didn't stick with it. So, and he just, you know, he kind of left that behind, you know, make it that what you will, but, um, you know, that, I, th I kind of, I think that's kind of where that comes from. And I, and that's, you know, it, again, it's just very complicated. And, you know, I always, I just, I find it so disturbing all, all the time. So, so sometimes I'll, you know, I'll go on the internet and go down the rabbit hole looking at, you know, Boy Scout, um, jamborees and rituals that they do and it's just you know it just it really gets under my skin and you know makes my blood boil so this is kind of a way to get back at that at, at that appropriation of culture um so then that you know that kind of ties a little bit too into you know um, sports mascots as well um and so the idea being that you know taking something from the Boy Scouts and reappropriating it to convey a message that, um, you know, that, that we're, we're well beyond these, uh, you know, generalized ideas of what you may have been taught about us and that, you know, we're very complicated individuals, we're, you know, we're sovereign nations, we're, we're much more than what you've been taught, <laughs> basically the idea. Um, so the title of the piece is Scouts Honor, and they are ballpoint pen drawings on Boy Scout neckerchiefs. I found the neckerchiefs on eBay. Um, And I thought it was really interesting because you know this this one had a map on it. Uh, this is a map of a jamboree camp for which this neckerchief was made. Um, so I feel like I'm kind of getting back at the Boy Scouts and taking these items that they were used in their you know Boy Scout ceremony and drawing directly on them and making them into my art. Um, and this one I thought was really interesting because uh, this this one doesn't have an image of a, a native mascot blazoned on it like the like the others. This one has an image of Junipero Serra, who was a Spanish missionary. Uh, he established missions in California and was very cruel to the native population in California where his missions were. And he was so cruel that <laughs> the uh, higher ups in the Catholic church in Spain uh, basically condemned him for what he was doing and told him he needed to stop, but he didn't because you know they were in Spain. California, so it's like, what are you going to do to stop me? Uh, so yeah, it's like he was just—he was very cruel and very notorious and uh, an awful person. Um, and with the removal of uh, the monuments recently, um, there were a few Junipero Serra monuments that were removed in California, thankfully, recently. Um, but then, you know, it's—it's—it's it's, it's just really interesting to to note the you know the Spanish influence. And, a lot of the tribes in uh, the Southwest and Pueblos, and that sort of thing. So again, you know, very complicated and not a cut and dry history. So, you know, the fact that the Boy Scouts are celebrating, you know, this, you know, this horrible missionary was just, you know, it, was, it was really intense when I found that, yeah. <laughs> that neckerchief online. I was like, oh my God. Yeah, no, it is, it is so um, complex too in, um, the 
the ways, I, I think we don't even fully understand the ways that um, different practices uh, and belief systems of different native and indigenous beliefs are just also integrated into American culture in really invisible ways too. Um, there's, yeah. you know, there's things we don't even think about and take for granted even beyond holidays or, you know, things like that, but it's, it's, um, there's, there's, I think there's, you know, just speaking about, uh, you're saying the origins of the Boy Scouts having some, you know, interest in a, in a connection to the earth, um, which, which maybe have originated with, um, indigenous practices or beliefs that, that, that I feel like that even expands beyond the Boy Scouts, that there's an interest there and that's part of the, our culture too, but we just don't know it that way or name it that way. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to say. And the other is I love the idea of, you know, the re, the re reappropriation of these uh, neckerchiefs um, and the, you're, you're like marking them, you're tagging them in a way, but it's like the most beautiful <laughs> type of tagging you can imagine. Thanks. Yeah, I actually had, you know, speaking about ledger art and who defines it and whatever, I had somebody once say to me that I was defacing ledger paper with my work. <laughs> Perfect. Because it was an important historical document or uh, whatever. That's really funny. Well, I, I want to, you know, if there's any other images you want to show, show us too, I'd love to just ask you about, um, you know, what feels like it's next for you. You've talked a little bit about that kind of exploration of, of some new tools, us using digital tools a little bit more. Um, and, and also, I guess the question is kind of what's next? What are you looking toward? And also wrapping into that question, I, I just want to ask about Chicago. Um, it's a place that you've been living and working for almost three decades now. Um, uh, and how you know is there anything that you're looking forward to doing in Chicago specifically um and how has how has your work been sort of how has your work been received um I guess I'll go with Chicago and that um what 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 myself and uh some other artists that are here are, are working towards, we're, we're really trying to solidify the idea that Chicago is an, an indigenous place. Um, you know, if, if you go to like uh, Minnesota, um, you know, there's a lot of native reservations there. Um, go to Wisconsin, there's a lot of native reservations. Well, not a lot, but more than in Illinois where there are not. So, you know, the idea of contemporary native people has pretty much been erased here. And so we're, we're kind of actively working to establish contemporary Native American identity here in Chicago that Chicago has always been and will always be a native place. Um, Uh, one interesting thing that's uh, coming up for me in the future is that uh, I'm going to be an artist in residence at uh, Legler Library, which is in Garfield Park. Um, and I guess this is the first time that the Chicago Public Library is having an artist in residence, which is uh, very exciting. Um, no pressure. But um, <laughs> What's interesting is that this, this library in Garfield Park has, um, I guess, well, they have, they have a, uh, a 1930s uh, mural that depicts uh, Marquette and uh, some, you know, in daily life with the natives in Marquette. So, you know, during the 1930s, our work projects administration. There were a lot of murals commissioned. Um, and a lot of them uh, deal with, you know, these uh, native themes of, of the area, um, you know, with 
Marquette coming in and um, Christianizing the natives and, you know, scouting the area for, you know, French settlement and whatnot. All the great stuff that led to that. But um, so part of what this uh, new residency will entail is kind of reinterpreting that mural and um, imposing or uh, offering my uh, indigenous viewpoint on on that mural, on that specific work of art. So, so we've discussed a, a few ways that um, I can I can intervene with, with that work. So, so that that'll be fun, interesting. What a great project. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Um, they they just uh, I think they're just finishing up a renovation of, of the library, and so part of that renovation was to create an artist studio within the library. So that's that's where I'll be. That's exciting. Well, Chris, we're gonna miss having you at the Art Center. That is for sure. And have, being able to look at your work as regularly as we have been able to, uh, despite the ups and downs of the year. Um, it's been wonderful working with you over this year. And I, I am so excited to see where the work, where it goes, how it, how it evolves. Um, it seems like it's a really important kind of transformational moment in your practice. Uh, thank you so much, Megan. Yeah, that, I'm going to really miss it here. But um, I realized that just because my residency is ending here doesn't mean my connection to the center and you all is not ending at all. So um, I've, I've been so grateful for all your help and everything that you've done for me in my, my career. So. Oh, yes, that you really just said it. I, I really think of it as hopefully just the beginning, the beginning of a relationship with your work and, and you know, the practice, really. So this is until soon. But thank you so much for joining me in the conversation. It was fantastic to see all this work together. You've done an amazing amount of work over this year and you've weathered all of the, the ups and downs of the year so well. Um, and I look forward to seeing what happens next in the next year. So thank you so much, Chris. And thanks everyone for joining us. Yep, thank you.